So uh, a short webinar. So what we are gonna do before the break is to give you an overview of the differences between the uh, new panel and the old panel, basically the layout differences. And that's gonna be a shorter presentation. I'm also gonna be showing you the new features of the panel and the new UXP version of the panel. And that's hopefully uh, done within an hour. Then after the break, uh, we're gonna be sharing some new techniques, tips and tricks, and hopefully also some uh, Q and A. So basically after the break, is useful also for people who are still using the older CEP legacy panels. So let's get started. So first of all, uh, you see here the older CEP legacy version, and this is the new Artisan Pro UXP. So what's the difference, first of all, from a technical point of view between the CEP and the UXP version? Well, basically the CEP legacy version that you see here is still, uh, well, you can still use it on, on, on all computers, but the thing is, if you have a new Apple computer with the uh, M1 or silicon uh, processor, then you can only use this if you start it up in uh, Rosetta emulation mode. Okay, so the thing is that Adobe announced two years ago that they are gonna be transitioning from the CEP platform to the UXP platform. That's basically very useful for, and, uh, for Apple users, for the new Apple users with the Apple M1 computers. But on top of that, it's gonna be faster. Okay, so that's one thing. And Adobe already announced two years ago that they're gonna be phasing out the old CP platform, which will mean that this older panel will not be, uh, will cannot be used anymore in Photoshop, but it's not, uh, uh, we're not that far yet. So it's still unknown when they are gonna phase it out. So the thing is, we are still supporting this panel because it has basically the same main features as the newer EXP version. But uh, just be warned, okay? It's, it's just a heads up that uh, I, I don't think it's gonna take much longer anymore for Adobe to, to phase out completely the older CEP platform. So then this cannot be used anymore. But for now, that's still not the case. You can still use both panels side by side or only this panel. So, and also on top of that is that uh, since uh, Adobe uh, did that, uh, we also have a different way of purchasing panel. So instead of purchasing it through the online store, uh, on my own online store, okay, you have to go to the, to, to, to this, uh, to the Adobe marketplace where you can buy. So we cannot keep track of all the, uh, uh, the, the buyers anymore. So we don't keep track of uh, any names anymore. So that's simply impossible for, for us. So only Adobe has all the information and uh, so if you are interested in still following webinars or are interested in news from the panel, then you have to sign up for our newsletter, okay? So here's the panel. That's gonna be a 25% uh, discount for all the people who still don't have the panel yet, starting today, okay? So just go to the Adobe Marketplace and then you can find this panel, all right? Uh, so Going back to my presentation over here. So um, that is basically the, the, the background information. Furthermore, what Adobe also did is to uh, also impose upon us to change the panel. So we couldn't use the older layout anymore uh, because there was a specific kind of uh, limitation to the, to the size of the buttons. Uh, for example, if you look here, then you see that they are much smaller. Also the font size and font types had to change. So we had to adapt to that. So that basically meant that we, have to, that we had to create an entirely new panel. So it's not only just a, a nicer layout, it's also built completely from the ground up. Uh, but I think the, the, the main difference is that, uh, well, this panel is a little bit bigger because we couldn't get it smaller because there was a specific limitation to the size of the bottles. So that's one thing. And uh, so let me now explain the, uh, the, well, the differences between the uh, layout between the CP and the UXP panels. Joel? So, yes. So the name of this new panel, just to be clear to everyone, is BW Artisan Pro X 2022, right? Yes, it's the same as the, the older CP version. See that? But this one is not available anymore. So everyone who uh, uh, purchased this panel, uh, we'll see the same name as in the new panel, okay? Because if you look at here, you see that's still the same name, 
Audison Pro X 2022. But you know that this is going to be the UXP version because it's it's only sold through the Adobe Marketplace. You cannot sell it uh, separately anymore. Okay, so if you buy it uh, and you buy it from the Adobe Marketplace, it's it it is the UXP version version only. Yeah, is that uh, clear, Mike? Yes, one more question, please. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the new Apple M1 computer. Will there be any differences for the Intel PC platform? So the thing is, you can use UXP version, uh, which is basically built for the new Apple M1 or silicon processor computers. You can also use it on all Intel computers. Okay, so that, that's not a problem. But if you want to use this one, the older version on the new Apple silicon processors, you can only do that if you start it up in Rosetta emulation mode. So, so basically you have two different types of computers. So all Intel, all Intel computers. So basically those are all Windows computers and also the older Mac computers, okay? So you can still use uh, uh, this one without any uh, emulation mode and this one, okay? For the new Apple computers uh, with the M1 processors, you can only use this one this version, but you can also use this one, but only in Rosetta emulation mode. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully, hopefully that's clear now. That's clear. All right. So uh, let's go through the layout differences first. So if you look here, then you see that uh, it, this is all still the same, except we have removed a few presets over there <clears throat> because it did, just didn't fit anymore there. So let's have a look at the tools now. So if you look here, the Pro Tools, the old version, <clears throat> you will see that uh, the luminosity mask was still there. And basically, uh, it's not, you can now find it in a drop down list over there. So luminosity mask, and they basically still work the same. There's not much of a difference here. What you see here, this is a very important section of the Pro Tools, is now can now be found over here under Pro Adjustments. And now you see immediately the first big difference in layout. And that's that if you look here, light and dark on the normal adjustments and under selective adjustments, then you see the following. There are only two presets right now and one slider instead of eight presets. So if you want to do something like this, D2 under normal adjustments, then what you do then is just put the slider on two, click darken. If you do this, let's say four and you click on light and that's the same as L4 there. And the same for this. Okay, there are some new options here that I'm gonna be explaining later on, but first layout differences, okay? So this is pretty self-explanatory, I hope. Okay, so light and dark. And so what this exactly does, normal adjustments versus the selective adjustments, I've already explained in many of my YouTube uh, videos, but also in my webinars. So I'm not gonna go into that. Okay, because that's uh, that's already been discussed uh, many times in the past. <clears throat> so that's the pro adjustments can now be found here. If you go to, to this part, so this is entirely new. I'm going to be explaining that later on as well. And the same for optimizations. This is not completely new compared to this one. So this here you can find over here, image upscaling. So it's a very well basic uh, preset that I tend to use quite often if I want to print my images uh, for larger format. So I'll be explaining that later on, but just briefly, because it was already available in the older version of the panel, okay? So those two I'm going to be explaining later. Let's go to the conversions, so over here, and you see it's still the same, right? It's uh, neutral, low key, all the things that are very important to me. And, uh, but basically I would always start with the neutral conversion. And uh, just so you know, uh, I only call the conversion, the black and white conversion, the, the transition from color to black and white in a neutral version. So a lot of people tend to call conversion everything that's, uh, well, that comes with, let's say, going from color to black and white, even the adjustments, but for me, that's, that's a separate phase. So I always say this is a black and white conversion, the neutral conversion, and all the other adjustments in terms of tonality, in terms of contrast, that is not a conversion anymore. That is the post-processing of the image. So that's a very specific and, and a distinction that I always use in my workflow, okay? Uh, so, but this hasn't changed, 
Okay, so this is pure black and white conversion of then and some other presets that might give you some inspiration. And by the way, this is the black and white uh, generator. I can also highly recommend, uh, well, trying out some of these presets if you need some inspiration. All right. <clears throat> so let's go to this one, styles. So formerly this was uh, this part, styles. Okay. So this is already explained in one of my older webinars. So you can look it up there, but basically it's it's still all the same because you have the styles without uh, uh, with, without the automatic uh, uh, generation of mass by Photoshop and the one with loading your own mass. So that's basically this one, but it's still the same. So I'm not gonna be explaining that either. All right, let's go to the adjustments. So now there's a bigger difference over here. So global adjustments, that's this part. Uh, what you see here is also in terms of, let's say layout is, uh, and for the global adjustments at least, the, the difference doesn't make, but there are some other differences over here. So I'll be explaining that later. But this is a very important part of my workflow. And especially this one, the low key and the mid key and the high key. And I'll be explaining that in the second part of this demonstration because what you will get to see then is a little bit of this. Okay, this is my, uh, well, this is my basic workflow. I'll be explaining that in the second part of this uh, session. So this is gonna be playing a very important role in this too. So more on that later on, the second part, uh, advanced adjustments. So over here, then you have to go in the other panel there. If there's a bigger difference there. So you see again here, you have the smart linear default, you have the smart linear strict over there, but with fewer buttons, all right? So if you are used to do, let's say D3 in the old panel, then all you have to do is to set this slider to three because there are four settings, okay, corresponding with what you see here. So if you want to do D3, then just go here and then click there. Very simple, right? And if you want to do L, four and you just click there. And the same for the smart linear strict and the smart linear appropriate but pre-created mask. Okay. This is uh, also a little bit different. Instead of uh, 12 buttons, we just have four right now. And this, the plus and the minus, so plus, double plus, triple plus, and the same for the minuses, correspond with what you see here, one, two, three, right? So if you click on, let's say, S curve triple plus, then you have to do it like this, put the slider all the way to the right, and then just click S curve, okay? And also what, what is important to know that this looks very similar to what you see here, global adjustments, okay? So let me go here in the new panel. So this is very similar to this part, but only the, diff the biggest difference is that this can be used on any selection without a, uh, without a natural hard edge. So only for selections with artificial hard, edge, hard edges. So for example, if you look at this flower, so let me do a quick demo first. Okay, I'm gonna do conversion, neutral, or we start with neutral. I've already created a mask like this. So basically this, this mask here, and by the way, also just for everyone who doesn't know it yet, I call this a channel mask, okay? If I do this, if I create a mask here, that's called a layer mask. I make the specific distinction between layer mask and channel mask. This is a layer mask, this is a channel mask, which is something different because the channel mask is the, uh, well, that you can load as a selection. So basically, okay, I'm gonna get rid of this. All right. So if I load that mask, you get the selection. This is selection, all right? So you can see here that there's a, a, a natural hard edge, right? It's, this is a natural hard edge. If I do this with a lesser tool, for example, there's a selection with an artificial hard edge. I mean, there's nothing natural to this, right? I mean, if I darken this, like, 
let's say like uh, so. Okay, you see that, okay, this is, I, I used the wrong one. Okay, I shouldn't be using this one. You select, okay, let me come over this first. So let's load it again. If I darken that with a normal, like this, you see that, that's hard edge, right? Okay, so this is an artificial hard edge. So the biggest difference, like I said, between this part and that part is that this is meant if you have a selection with a natural hard edge, because if you have that, I can do this selection, load selection of the flower like that. I can click a low key. I don't need to worry about, let's say the uh, bleeding over the edge, right? Like this, because it's a natural hard edge and you don't see the bleeding over the edge. If you see that. If I use the other one, let me use that one. Let me load the selection again, flower. And I use the advanced adjustments. I can do, I can basically do the same over here. Okay, but now it will start bleeding over the edge because what it, what it, what it is trying to do is to make sure that it blends in with the rest of the image because it expects a, a selection with a, with, a, uh, with an artificial hard edge. So it will blend in smoothly with the rest of the, uh, uh, of the image. So if I click on that, see that then you still see the same there, but it's gonna bleed over the edge. I hope you can see it here. You see it's, well, it's already dark the background, so you, it's hard to see it, but I think you can see it. If this were a lighter, uh, background you should, you should be able to see it more clearly but this is actually meant for this you know let me try doing it again so here i can just click on low key let, let me do it with a normal setting like two and you see that it's dark in there you see that and at the same time blending smoothly with the rest of the image so this is the, the biggest difference between this under advanced adjustments and the global adjustments, but it does exactly the same, okay? In terms of effect. All right, so that is the uh, advanced adjustments. Let's go to the microsound adjustment. There is a bigger change there. Okay, let me go here because you could find it here in the older panel. So this is still the same, all right? The drop down list with the zones and let me start with this new feature. So you, now you can turn on the zone preview. By the way, I would only turn it on if you need it. If you don't need it, just turn it off because it's, it, it can be quite annoying if you are hovering over this because what you see there is a preview of the zone of the zone zero in this case. You see that? This is zone zero, that part that is white, but also the background. So basically I can now have an indication, a rough indication of where the zones exactly are in the image. So for example, zone three would be uh, anything between 70 and 92. If you wanna know where it is approximately, you will see it there. And of course, if you create them then, you will see that it's much more advanced and more subtle than the preview. But it, it's rough, a rough indication of what you can expect, all right? Okay, I'm gonna deactivate it now. I'm not gonna explain the, uh, how the microphone works because that's something that I've already explained in my previous webinars. So this is the zone preview. This is something that I think is quite handy, but just turn it off if you don't need it. All the rest, so the subtle, medium, strong, darkened or lightened, that's now being uh, well done by the slider. Okay, just a few buttons there, but you have to click on this now. Okay, so this is uh, two, that corresponds with medium, uh, one with uh, subtle, and three with strong. Pretty self-explanatory, I think, right? So then you have to click on the dark and lighten, or the one on the strict adjustments that represents the same, okay? Then also this button that you see there, the info box, okay? Turn it on or off. 
Okay, so that's the microsound. And there's also something new that I'll be explaining later because this is not, uh, uh, this is not available here. So I will explain that later with the new features. So let's go to the color first now. So that can be found here, toning. So this part, the basic toning is under toning here. So color now uh, contains the toning and the color grading. Okay, so basic toning is still the same. Uh, split toning also the same. So nothing changed there. It's all the same. And then the color grading is also a little bit different. And the thing is that in the older panel, you could hover over it and see all the, the palettes. Well, uh, Adobe didn't allow that because it, it wasn't available yet. So we had to do something else. And so what we did was to create this. Then you get to see all the uh, color palettes like this. All right. So this is not something that we wanted, uh, but the that specific feature wasn't available yet on the USB platform. So it's still in progress also from Adobe side. <clears throat> so that's the color and uh, split toning. So now there's a, uh, the last one. So this has a bigger difference. And then we go into the new features so I can explain that. And then we have to break and we go with the new techniques. All right, so the uh, creating depth, a very important part in my workflow. So this is still the same in the drop down list, but now you have instead of the small, medium, large coverage, okay, so the coverage of let's say the transition from dark to light or light to dark, uh, instead of that, we now have the two bars, three bars, and four bars. So this is basically small, medium, large. So instead of having, uh, what is this, uh, 12 presets, well, in total, something like 24 presets, you just have six and a slider. So that saves a lot of space, right? And it's much clearer, I hope. So if you want to do, let's say, a medium D2 from bottom to top, then you set this to two, you pick out the, the medium, this, this one, and click on that. So it's basically the same. Uh, the same for let's say uh, the lights if you want to do a large l3 well you just go here and you set the slider to three and then click on that because there are just four different flavors right from one to four corresponding with the intensity that you see here so this is the biggest difference to sml that is now two bars three bars four bars right uh, but it saves a lot of space. It's much clearer uh, to restore. So basically we had here, what was it? Uh, 16, 32 presets. That has now been replaced by eight presets and a slider. Okay, that is a big difference. So I believe it's also much clearer now. Uh, it still works the same. So for example, if you want to do an extra small from bottom to top restore, then you just set it to one because one corresponds with extra small, two with small, this is medium, this is large. So this is extra small, then click on that. If you want to do a diagonal restore, but let's say, let's take this one small over there from uh, bottom left to top right, then you just, well, use this one and set it to two because that's small. Makes sense, right? I think it's much clearer here. So that's the uh, the biggest difference. So you need to get used to it. I'm already very used to using this one. So if I go back to the older panel, then I have to think a little bit longer now. Uh, so this is what, I, uh, what I'm used to using. And it didn't take me a lot of time to get used to this new layout. So are there any questions about the layout now? I think it's, very self-explanatory, right? It's not very interesting. It's not very exciting. Are there any questions about that? And hopefully you do agree that this layout is much more intuitive, clearer, hopefully. Any remarks, comments, questions on the layout before I go into the new features of the panel? Why, why was a slider chosen instead of having uh, maybe four buttons there. Was because, that for 
uh, future features to add more uh, now, increments it, later? Now, what, what Adobe told us was that, okay, we couldn't use the smaller presets anymore like this. There was a specific limitation to the font size, so we had to use a, a different kind of font size. So those smaller presets weren't allowed anymore, okay? And so we had to use this. And so if, if we did the same here as, as we did here in the new panel, then this would be a very, very large panel with lots of buttons and that wouldn't even fit here anymore, okay? So it had all to do with the limitations that uh, Adobe imposed upon us. But at the same time, I think it's also very beneficial for us because the thing is, I believe it's much clearer now with, with fewer presets. But that's at least my take on it. Is that clear, Mike? Yes, we have a question from Jorge. Jorge, you want to unmute? Yes, thank you, Mike. So, Joel, this is really nice, that the new, the new panel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I like the feature where you can visualize the different zones. Yeah. My question is, all the sliders have discrete values. So it has to be a one or a two or a three, but you cannot be in between. Is no. it possible and would it be helpful to have a continuous uh, a slider that goes from one to four? Well, that's something that we've been considering and it's still something that I'm still considering, you know, and uh, I need to try it out. And, and maybe that's going to be available in the near future for some presets, not all of them, but some. Okay, because uh, for example, if you want to do this, for example, uh, let's say the, let's say this one, you know, uh, advanced adjustment, this, you know, there's, there's already something like that with the, with the intensity. So it's not needed to uh, go with something like this anymore, right? Uh, for at least it's available here, with the intensity, not so much here. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's going to work out well, because the thing is, it's uh, it, per, it, it works in a very complicated way. And I'm not sure if we can translate it to a slider. All right. That, that is something that uh, I'm not yet sure of. But I, I, uh, I wonder, Joel, in those cases, you can probably fine tune the opacity of the layer. Is that possible with the panel? Yes. After you make the adjustment? That's also possible, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but so it's, it's still something that, that, we're, that we're considering, but uh, I'm not sure that if we're gonna implement that for all the presets, maybe yes. for some, but not yet for all, okay? Thank you, Joel, thank you. I heard another question. Yes, can you use the opacity slider on that particular level to get the gradations? Uh, well, you, you could you could do that, but I wouldn't recommend doing that uh, the way that it's built right now. Okay, I, I wouldn't do that. But the thing is, if we are going to implement it, then it works with a, with a similar kind of slider, also with an opacity slider, but it works a little bit differently then. Okay, but if you do this now with an opacity slider, uh, you know, the results will become unpredictable. So you could, you could try it out. Uh, but I cannot guarantee it, okay? Any other questions before we go to the new features? No? All right. So let's go to the newer features. So let's go back. So can close this off. All right, there we go. So first of all, if you go here to the first uh, section, the uh, luminosity mass didn't change. Well, actually, sorry, I, I forgot to say this. Uh, there's also the microsounds that have changed. Instead of the 22 buttons, we just have one slider now. So it, it works the same. So you can set it to zone zero or zone 10. And on top of it, you can also uh, turn on the zone preview. So you see then where the zone 10 is like this, okay? But usually turn it off. And if you wanna uh, create, let's say a zone three, just click on create and that's it. So instead of 22, buttons, you just have one slider and uh, the create and remove button. Okay, so I'm not gonna be discussing that. So let's go to the pro adjustments because here's a, a very big and important uh, new feature. So basically, you know, if you uh, use this, so all the blending turned off, then actually it, it expects a uh, selection 
with a natural hard edge, right? Something like, all right, demonstrate it here, flower. Okay, let me lighten it like this. And then this is the result that you get. So it expects a natural hard edge. Go back there, all right. But if you have something like a, like this, so let me save that. Save selection, call it test more. Then if you try to do this the same, then you will see that it looks like nothing, right? This is not uh, very useful. So what we've done now then is to, hold a minute, let's go back one. Create a new duplicate layer because when you are working with the pro adjustments, you always have to do everything manually, all right? So you have to create a new layer yourself manually. Because the thing is the pro adjustments works on different levels. So it's not only in editing mode, but the layers, but it also works in channel modes. So if you are editing mask or creating mask, you can also use the pro adjustments. And that's something that I've uh, demonstrated extensively in one of my previous webinars. And uh, so that's why uh, we made it such, and that's why we call it pro adjustments, that you have to do everything manually. So if you uh, want to use this, so create a duplicate layer. Now I can load that selection again that I saved, test one. So this is a uh, hard selection with an artificial hard edge because th uh, there's no natural hard edge there. I can now click on lighten, okay, and turn on the auto blending. And then you'll see this. So it will blend in smoothly with the rest of the, uh, of the image like this. And of course, there's always a little bit of bleeding over the edge because there's no other way that you can uh, make sure that something's blending in smoothly with the rest of the image if you don't have any bleeding edge. Okay, it's not only a matter of feathering because I know that a lot of people are feathering it. I do that too, but on top of that, there's also going to be behind the scenes a sort of counter correction, uh, and I'm doing that with a sort of uh, restore behind the scenes. So it's actually more accurate than feathering, uh, but still, there's always going to be some bleeding. That's just necessary if you want to make sure that something's blending in with the rest of the image. So this is something that uh, you can turn on and off if you are using an artificial hard edge. So some people might ask me that, okay, isn't that the same, Joel, as when you go to adjustments, advanced adjustments, and then load that, and then just click on, let's say, uh, what was it, what, what I used, light in three, something like that. So like, like this, so the smart linear strict, Yes, basically it's the same, it's the same. But the thing is, you know, that this is um, mainly useful for people who are not very used to, let's say, uh, using masks with luminosity masks intersected. Okay, I'm gonna be explaining that in a, in a few minutes. But so this is basically the same as the, uh, the Pro Tools, but now it's been automated here. The biggest difference is when you are using the following. So I'm gonna remove this. If you go to microservice adjustments. So I've explained this also in previous webinars, also in the shorter YouTube videos. And the thing what you need to do here is to, well, you have to take a few samples like this, and then you have to decide where that specific value is in the zones then let's say you click on zone three, okay? You can activate it like that. Okay, so it's been activated. And then you can select this. Okay, let's call it test two. I'm just gonna save it. And then you can just click on, for example, darken set to three, and then it will darken that specific part, but only the darker tones like that. And it's automatically blended, right? I hope you can see it, difference, right? So that's what you can do with, with the, uh, with the micro zones. And don't forget to turn it off, deactivate it if you're done, because what it does is to create specific uh, channels in the background. 
Okay, you don't have to use that. You don't need to know how it's uh, working exactly. You just click on deactivate. But the idea is that this is, uh, well, the idea is to make it simple for people who are not used to use luminosity mass combined with hard mass. So then it, all you need to do is like that, activate the right kind of zone, and then just click dark and light. That's it, right? You, you don't need to worry about anything else. But the thing is that uh, if you want to have even more control, then it's always better to create luminosity mass yourself and to use it in uh, combination with hard mass and intersect them because then you have much more control. So I've created this for people, uh, let's say who are beginners to uh, intermediate while I've created the tools, the pro tools with, uh, with the new uh, auto blending feature and the luminosity mass for the more advanced users. So that you have more control. Okay, so let me demonstrate that now. I'm gonna do the same that I did with, uh, with this now. So I'm gonna remove this. So how do you do that uh, with, the, uh, with the pro adjustments? So what you have to do then, of course, is starting off with creating luminosity mass. So it's more work, you know, but you have so much more control, but you also need to know how to evaluate luminosity mass. And that is also something that I've explained in many of my previous webinars. Uh, so hopefully uh, there are already people here who know how to use and evaluate luminosity mass. By the way, I use it in a very different way than uh, other people, other instructors who are also creating panels. I use it in a very different way. I always evaluate luminosity mass. I always assess it myself, okay? So let's say that I wanna darken this part but only for the darker values there. What I do then is of course, go to the dark luminosity mass. I would create a few darks starting with this. And then we just pay attention to this part. Let's say that I wanna uh, do the same here. So I'm gonna, let's say, I'm gonna focus on that area, test two. So I'm gonna be focusing on this area. Okay, I want, just wanna darken the darker tones in here in this specific area. So, then if you look here on darks in darks four, then it's completely black. So it's not useful. So it's, the first that I can use is darks three because there's still light, right? Okay. If you, do, if you think that, uh, if you cannot follow this part, then just go to my older webinars because I've explained it in there. I'm gonna remove the rest. Okay. Let me load that uh, selection again. So that is just darks three copy, okay? But I also want to have more control with the half values and the quarter values. So I'm just going to be looking in there. So what I'm going to be creating now is the half values. So I know that darks four is two darks. So I have to have maximum darks three and a half because four and a half would be over the limit of four. So this is what I need to use then. So I can also copy that, right? So I can get rid of the rest and like that. So I have two and a half, sorry. I have three and three and a half, so I can use both of them. I can also use two and a half maybe, but then it becomes too light. And I like to have a more granular, uh, granular kind of control of my uh, adjustments. <clears throat> so now we've created the, darks, the quarter values like this. So I know that I need to be around three. So I think 275 might be useful. So I'm gonna copy that too, but also 325 right? Because that's between three and three and a half, like that. So now I can get rid of the rest. So now I have three, 325, three and a half, 375. So starting here, which is, which has a larger range when you adjust it. And this, sorry, it needs to be like this, 275, three, three, okay. This has a smaller range, okay? So it's more controlled in this case. So, I'm going to be applying it now. I'm going to create a duplicate layer first, like this. I'm going to load that selection. Test two. Okay, and now I just want to darken those darker values already in there. So if I take a sample, you see that's around 117, 127, 107. Just look here, okay, at the RGB values. Okay. So those are the values that I'm targeting, okay? 
And instead of relying on the microstone adjustments with the uh, preset uh, luminosity mass, I evaluate them myself. So I'm just gonna look here. If I have this selection, so I'm gonna be in there. You see that, yes, if I use this luminosity mass, I can use it, but it will be quite strong the adjustments. This would be more subtle. This would be even more subtle, but it's not gonna affect this area anymore, all right? So I just wanna have something in between. So maybe this is gonna to be too dark. Well, actually I like it. So I'm gonna be using this one, 325, because those are exactly the, the dark tones in here, over there that I want to adjust without adjusting too much of the rest. So I'm gonna be using 325, all right? So now you have to go, I've already created this one, load the selection, test two, like that. And now I have to load the 325 myself manually, intersect it like that. Okay, so now it, it has been uh, intersected, meaning it, the luminosity mass will only work in that specific hard selection, in that specific area, and not beyond that. And now I go to Pro Adjustments, and now I can say, okay, I want to have, uh, I want to darken it with an intensity of three, but I just want the auto blending turned on. Okay, let's do four because then you can easily see it. Okay, I'm going to click on that. I'm going to click a few more times because it's really subtle, okay? Because you see that there, but it will automatically blend. So basically it's the same kind of thing as with the microsounds, but now you have more control over it. You can exactly select the luminosity mass that you feel works right for you, okay? So instead of relying on what uh, microsounds does, so for example here, because you can only set, uh, change this, and then you have to click on darken or, or lighten. Okay, but you cannot really choose the, the right kind of luminosity mass. And so instead of doing that, you can do this, which is basically the same, but with more targeted and more granular control. And that's why we created the auto planning because now you can do everything manually, okay, uh, with the panel and still have the same kind of results as, as with Microsoft. So, and the advanced adjustments are basically the same as with the, without the luminosity mass. If you do an adjustment with an artificial hard mass in there, because in the past what we needed what we uh, needed to do in the past was like this. So before the auto blending, I could still do this. You know, I can still do that. But the but now but then we all, we could only do this. We had to create a rectangular mass because uh, how we let's say made sure that the blending was still there was with the restore feature. But, you know, it, we, uh, I thought that wasn't uh, flexible enough. It couldn't follow the shape. So that's why we decided to create the auto blending. So in the past, we had to do this, a new duplicate layer, do this, and then I would save it, save selection, call it test three, all right, and now I would, uh, loaded with that, intersected with that within this area. Okay, like that. And then I could darken it. Okay, a few times. And you see that, you see the, the, the uh, artificial hard edge there. But then I could load the selection. Test three is that. And then go here. And then I could restore it. And then you would have the same kind of effect. But, you know, it, it doesn't follow the specific shape that you actually wanted to have for this specific adjustment, right? You can only do rectangular shapes because that's the only way that the restore feature will work. So that's why this is so important, the auto blending. But uh, if you use it, just turn it on and turn it off uh, after that. Because the thing is, you know, it uh, will take uh, quite a bit of your resources in the background. All right, just turn it off if you don't need it. Is this clear as well? The difference between uh, the previous situation and the new situation with the auto blending are what it adds to the already existing features, especially the ones that you can find here with the microsounds. Is that clear? I have a question. Go ahead. 
if you go too far with darken, would you uh, adjust it with lighten or is it better to use control Z to go back in history? I would go back in history, you know, because I, if you try to uh, counter correct that with a <clears throat> lighten, it would have a different kind of effect. I would always be going back into history. That, that's much better. And, you know, the thing is that the, the adjustments in the panel, when you are in layer mode, so basically when you're editing an image, they're always very subtle, right? I mean, even the strongest version there is quite subtle. I mean, I can show you here. Uh, let me get rid of this. Command J, duplicate the, the layer, load that uh, the selection again. So sometimes you need to go past where you would normally stop just to see how far, you know, what would happen. Yes, and you then, can, so you're you're always going to want to go back. Yes, you can do that. That that's correct. But you know the thing is the, the presets are built in such a way that they always work in a very subtle way. I mean, I've loaded it now, and I click on dark with intensity four, with auto blending on, and you see that. I mean, it's just a minor difference, right? I mean, see that I have I really have to click a few times with the intensity of four to to make it even visible, right? So I clicked on it, I think three times, and then becomes visible, even with the setting strength, with the strength setting set to four. Mm -hmm. So it, if you are, let's say, uh, making something too dark, then you really uh, did something that uh, a little bit too much, <laughs> Mike, okay? So mm -hmm. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. But the thing is also that I would always use selective adjustments, very rarely the uh, normal adjustment, because this, you only need if you have pure white or pure black. And so that's a value of L0 or L255. So then you have to add a value before you can uh, adjust it with selective adjustments. And that is something that I also explained in my previous webinars, okay? Because this is much more subtle than this. And this is especially useful when you are creating hard mass. So I'm not doing that right now, but this and that, it's also very, very, very useful for creating hard mass. Okay, but normally speaking, you should be using this one, not that one. Okay, more questions? No? Okay, so we've done that. Let's go remove this part. And now let's go to sky mask. Okay, that's a nice one. So what we've done so is to create this new sky mask feature. All right. Basically, uh, we've taken the, the, the new Photoshop algorithm, build it in here, and enhance that with my advanced masking techniques. Okay, so that's what we've uh, been doing. So uh, on average, I think, the masks that we create here with the new sky mask feature are better, especially for, let's say, fine art processing than the uh, basic sky mask feature that you can find here in Photoshop. So that is this one. So we've enhanced that and made it better. And it's especially useful for people who are into, especially black and white fine art editing. And as you know, uh, uh, people who are into black and white fine art editing like to push the contrast quite a bit. And then those masks that Photoshop creates, by the way, they are great masks. Okay, but not always useful. But uh, if you like to push the contrast quite a bit, then I believe our masks are even better. So let me show you briefly how I would do that. So, okay, this is an image that uh, actually I'm, uh, not sure if I'm allowed to show this. Okay, this is so. Let me let me give you some background information. Uh, I, earlier this year, I had a an assignment uh, for from Qatar Airways to shoot architecture in Qatar. So that's what I've been doing. So I've created a series of 29 black and white fine art images of all the architecture in Qatar. Well, not all the architecture, but let's say the most important architecture in Qatar. Normally, 29 images is something that I would create in, let's say, two and a half years. Because it takes me that long to come up with something that I'm really happy with, especially when we're talking about 29 images. So I did all that 
uh, just the post processing in a little bit more than three months. So I've created 29 images. So you can imagine that I had to do something about my workflow. So one of the, uh, the most important things that I had to do was to create masks more automatically. So that's why I uh, took that sky mask feature and uh, enhanced it. Okay, there are some more, let's say, advanced masking techniques that I that are not built into this panel yet, but that we are considering to build in into the new Quick Mask Pro for UXP. So there's even more masking, advanced masking in there. But this one is a very important uh, feature for me to enhance my workflow. But on top of that, uh, the panel should also work much faster. And that's what this UXP version of this panel is doing. So the series of 29 fine art images in black and white for Qatar Airways was entirely done with this panel, nothing else. So basically all the features that I need as a black and white fine art photographer are in here. You won't find anything that's redundant, nothing. So everything that's in here, I would use myself. So I didn't use any other feature in Photoshop except for what's already available in the panel. So uh, even more background information, so I, I like to digress. A lot of people are always asking me, Joe, you know, your uh, YouTube videos, your webinars, your paid videos are always so long, you know? It's like four hours, six hours, even one with nine hours. And the thing is, you know, in the beginning I thought, is that because I'm so long-winded and boring or what? But then I thought to myself, no, Joe, it's not because of that. Well, I'm also boring, I know that, but <laughs> that's not the point here. The thing is <clears throat> that this panel is much more than a collection of features. Basically, it represents my philosophy of black and white fine art photography. Basically, it represents all the principles and rules that I believe are important in creating good black and white fine art images. So basically uh, every feature that you see in here, there's a specific underlying philosophy to that. It, it is built in such a way that you cannot, let's say, forget about the underlying principles uh, without knowing exactly how to apply that feature, that preset. So what I'm trying to do during my webinars in my videos is not only explain the presets, but also explain a little bit of uh, the underlying principles, because that is important. So it's more than just uh, a software that you need to learn to use. It's also a, an educational software. So it forces you almost to follow the, the principles that I believe in. Principles like I explain in here or in my other videos. Okay, so I'm not going to be explaining all those principles today, but just so you know, that is one of the reasons that my webinars are always so long, you know, because I cannot just explain the presets. Okay, you can darken it with this, you can use this transition. Because what I want to do is to give you uh, insight why that is needed. So that's a completely different approach. So basically, what I'm trying to teach you is my entire philosophy of black and white fine art photography. And you get that as a sort of present together with this panel. But, you know, and I realized to myself, you know, that, you know, this is something that's not always, it's not, uh, not for everyone. I know that, but I'm not targeting everyone. I'm just targeting a select group of people who are into black and white fine art photography and who are passionate about it and who want to learn about it. and and who can appreciate all the experience and knowledge that I have gathered over the years in black and white fine art photography. And that's why I created this panel. And that's why my webinars, my videos, and my explanations are always that long. Okay, so just so you know, as sort of background information. Okay, now get back to what I'm trying to do here. Let me, okay, this is the, actually the wrong image. What I wanted to show you was this one, actually. Okay, this is a better example. So it's another one that I took in Qatar. So it's opening up. So this is one of the stadiums that I shot in Qatar. So it's one of the stadiums of the World Cup 2022. Okay. Uh, so 29 images, architecture, 
So the, the accuracy was very important. So the sky mass and the control over all other mass was very important. So what I've done is to take that Photoshop feature and enhance it. So if I want to create a mask for this photo, then you just start off with the sky mask default. Okay, let's do that. That's the, the recommended preset. So if you do that, then you will see that in the background, it created this. And you see here that this part, for example, is still light. So it's not pure black and white. A hard mask needs to be either pure black or pure white. Okay, so this is, this is gonna be selected. This is not gonna be selected. And here you see, this is more something like a luminosity mask or a soft mask. So maybe you're happy with that. Uh, I would always try to get full control of this guy. So I would try to enhance that. Well, there are several ways of enhancing it, but before you do that, maybe it's better to click on this preset. So let's say sky mask conceal more, basically say it will add more black to it. Okay, so let me rename this to uh, default. Now let me try to create the same mask now with the sky mask conceal more. Okay, there it is. And you see, this is the new one. If you compare it with the previous one, it's already more black. Well, the thing is, you cannot get us completely black. Now, why is that? And if you have followed my advanced masking workshops or followed the video, you will know that uh, there are only three masking methods. It's a contrast-based method, it's a color-based method, and there's the manual method. So, and the contrast-based method is the most important method. It's also the, the, the method that is underlying the Photoshop masking feature. Okay, they also use uh, artificial intelligence to detect objects, but basically, you know, the, the real masking uh, in Photoshop, the, the sky feature that takes place here is also contrast-based and a little bit of color-based and nothing else. So the, what they do with the artificial intelligence to detect specific objects. Okay, okay, this is a sky, this is not a building, for example. That's the only thing that the artificial intelligence is doing, but the real masking is always contrast-based and or color-based but mostly contrast-based. So the thing is here, if you look here, there's simply not enough contrast to separate the building, the edge of this building, this specific area from the sky, right? Just look here. Here, you really have to guess, right? I mean, this is something that, uh, it, that will not work in an automated way. Photoshop doesn't uh, succeed in doing that. I do not succeed in doing that. And the simple answer to that is because, you know, there's simply not enough contrast and there are also not enough unique colors to separate the sky from the, from the, from the building. Okay, so that's why you end up at best with something like this in an automated way. So if you have this, but you can do that, okay, let's say I'm gonna be using it, I'm gonna be removing this. You can use this as a starting point and then say, Okay, give me some more black, so enhance the black. But what I would always say uh, during my masking sessions, if you need more than two or three passes, you're gonna degrade the quality of the edges. So never go beyond two or three passes. Whatever you need to correct in masking mode, so I'm not talking about editing mode in layer in your layers panel, okay? I'm talking about masking mode in your channels panel. Whenever you need to adjust something, Never go beyond two or three passes, okay? So I'm trying that with this. So this one pass, you see it's already getting dark. Let's do a second pass. And you see, this will never turn black. I can do a third pass, but then I know that chances are high that I will degrade the quality of my edges. So I'm not, uh, I prefer to not do that. Okay, so how can I solve that then? Okay, I'll show you that in a, sec in a second. Uh, an alternative of uh, adjusting the, the darker tones in there to adding more black is to, okay, I have to go back in history now to, to passes. Okay, so instead of doing this or that, so this to enhance the white there, 
all right? Instead of doing that, just grab your brush, set it to overlay, set it to, in this case, to 100%, set it to foreground color black, and then try to do, uh, to fix it in two passes, like this. Okay, this one pass, I'm not releasing the mouse. Okay, one pass, second pass, and you see I still cannot fix it. Basically the same result as with the enhanced black two times, right? Very similar to that. So how can I fix that? Well, then you, what remains is the manual method. So you have to go in there with your pen tool, all right? Uh, if this were a hair or fur or tree branches, it would be impossible. So in that case, you know, if you have something like this, but not enough contrast to specific areas of your photo, and you are dealing with trees or with hair or fur, whatever, that is very intricate, you cannot fix it. Okay, that's why it's so important to already start masking in the field, not in Photoshop, but in the field. That's something that most people tend to forget that you actually start masking in the field already making sure that you are aware of the unique colors in your environment, let's say sky versus your object or the contrast behind your object. You always need to be aware of that because if, if, you, if you are aware of that and you take it for granted, the contrast, you're gonna be uh, uh, well, spending a lot of time in Photoshop to correct it, okay? And sometimes, you know, you don't have any other choice then you can take it for granted and in that case, I will show you how you can fix that if you are dealing with man-made objects. You cannot fix this if this were natural objects like trees or whatever, okay? But in this case, I, we're dealing with man-made objects. So what you do then is just go in here and this is just a quick trick, okay? And most people already know that. So I would create a duplicate layer there. And here I would enhance the contrast just a little bit. And by the way, uh, I know what you're gonna ask next. So why don't you enhance the contrast already before you start masking, Joel? That, well, I wouldn't do that because that works in a different kind of way. Because then your, uh, the, the, the original image information is gone. Okay, because you're not only fixing this part there, okay, make it more visible, but what you're also doing is fixing the rest of the image that didn't need any fixing. Okay, here, I just wanna fix this area. So I'm just gonna darken it a little bit make sure that I can see that edge a little bit better. I'm just gonna darken it, something like this, okay? But if I zoom out, you will see that this gets darker too, okay? In this case, it, it, it goes well, you know? But normally you would also ruin this part that is already good, okay? That doesn't need any fixing. So that's why I'd never do this in advance. I would never ever change the contrast or the calls or whatever before I start masking. I would only change it just to fix some areas that I need to deal with, like in here, and just to see it better. So now we go in there, okay, that specific area. And I know that it is this part that I need to fix, right? This part roughly starting here, ending all the way there. So I'm now going to go in there to grab my pen tool. I'm not going to explain the pen tool, but I think most of you already know how to use a pen tool. So I'm just gonna do it very quickly. Just not super accurate, but all right. Let's say like that. Like that. Okay, then I'm gonna stop here, okay? Well, let's, let's, let's do this too, hold on. So it's a little bit more clear. Yeah. Then I would close the circle, of course. Then do this, make selection. I always have the feathering standard to 0.1 pixels, just a little bit of feathering, so you don't get to see the jagged edges. Then go in here, so while the selection is still on, okay, and then just click on this for adjustment, you can just click on this and then it's filled. You see that? I had to do this too, but it's just for the sake of uh, explaining. You see that? So that's how you fix it. If you are dealing with man-made objects. So that's a sky mask feature and the, uh, it's this one, sorry, yeah. 
I hope that's clear. Is this clear? Anyone have any other questions about this part? I have a question, Joel. This is Jorge. Hello, Jorge. Uh, do you think the lasso tool would give acceptable results uh, if you don't want to use the pen tool? Because the pen tool can be difficult to use, but maybe the lasso tool is easier but I don't know if the results would be comparable. I think it's a little bit harder to have the same kind of results with less a tool because the pen tool is simply just more accurate. And, you know, it's actually not that difficult to use the pen tool, you know? Yeah, you just have to, okay, I just give you one tip. Okay, just give you one tip. And just to encourage you to use the pen tool. So this speaks for itself, right? You can uh, place an anchor point there and you can, let's say, place an anchor point there. And then you need to, Come up with the curve there, right? So what you need to remember is the following. If you want to make that curve, you need to stretch out the handles, right? And the handles, the top of the handle, let's say that, that white circle you see there, will roughly indicate where the, uh, the maximum point of the curve is. So you see that there. If I do this, stretch out the handle even more than, you see that the curve, the maximum point of the curve will be over there. All right, so you can regulate it with this handle, and by looking at the white circle where the the let's say the maximum uh, curve is, okay, and then of course if you want to go here, you just have to click Alt or Option, and then you have to remove that handle before you can go on in a normal way. So that that is just the only trick that I want to give you, because if you want to know more about it, it's then you can yes, look on, the, on YouTube, but the thing is, you really need to practice, and this is much more accurate than the last tool. Thank you, thank you, Joel. Somebody pointed out there is a new version that's called the curvature pen, which is a lot easier to use, also. Okay. But and okay. also, somebody corrected me when I say the lasso tool, I, I meant the polygonal lasso. I know, I know, I know. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that thank was. you, yeah, but, thank you, Joel. But, but still, this one is better, okay, this is more accurate. <laughs> At least it is for me. All right. So, any more questions about this? Uh, yeah, uh, I have a I have a question. Uh, I, I was just wondering, would it make sense to have bracketed the exposure just to be able to get a better mask? You could do that. Yeah, yeah. If, if you do that, if you do the bracketing in the field, then you're already, let's say, masking in the field, right? I mean, then you you'll be uh, more sure that the contrast around the entire figure because that's how I call the main object in a photograph, that the contrast around the main figure is always there, okay? But, you know, bracketing is sort of a way of uh, masking in the field. So that's, right. it, that, that's right. always better, yeah. But the thing to remember is masking always starts in the field, not in Photoshop. If you think that it starts in Photoshop, that Photoshop can perform miracles, well, you know, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> It's really not going to happen. Okay, it's just clear because then I'll be doing the latest, the last uh, demo with the new feature. Then we go to the break and we do the new techniques. All right, so I'm going to be closing this down. There are a couple questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, Beat, if you want to ask your question, please unmute yourself. Yes, hello. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, Joel, for this uh, presentation so far. My problem, which I described in the chat, is um, I, I struggle a bit with this automatic sky masking. If I have, if I don't have straight or clear lines, such as in architecture, so my my problem always appears if I do, for example, a mountain peak against the sky. Yeah. But, uh, is there any other solution, or is that just my problem? <laughs> No, it's not just your problem. So first of all, start masking your field. Okay, so that's one thing. And the, the second solution is to follow my advanced masking method because that goes even farther than this. Okay, because then yeah. you can do, do so much more. Because the thing is, I cannot automate all my advanced masking techniques within this panel. Well, perhaps I can do that. Maybe I'm going to attempt that for the new Quick Mask Pro UXP version. So that's something that I'm going to attempt. <clears throat> and if so, then, well, then even 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 better 
But for now, you know, uh, this is the best that we can do. And you can fix it if you have man-made object, if you have a uh, natural object, you know, then, uh, well, then it really depends on the contrast or the avail uh, availability of unique colors. And if you don't have that, you have to fix it manually. And then you can uh, resort to my advanced masking for you because there I explain how to really do that. Then, yeah. Okay, yeah. Good. great, thanks. Yeah. So I'd like to point out something that Joel said in a previous uh, session, and that is uh, if you're masking the natural uh, earth, it's much less important to have a precise mask than it is if you're masking something like architecture. So, uh, you know, don't don't be quite so uh, hard on yourself to try to get an exact mask when you're masking landscapes. Yes, because the thing is with, let's say, uh, let's say a mountain, okay? So you have a specific line in the mountain and you don't see that quite well. So basically you can just draw a straight line with your pen tool. I mean, no one's gonna notice that. Of course you're cheating that, but no one's gonna notice that. If you try to do that with architecture, let's say I would draw a straight line here, everyone's gonna notice because you have a specific kind of expectation of how architecture looks like, of how curves looks like and how uh, a straight line looks like, right? I mean, so that's why the accuracy in architecture is even more important. With, uh, with, with let's say natural objects, you can basically invent some lines, you know, <laughs> just to call it that way. But of course, you know, it's always better to have a very exact kind of uh, selection of, the, of the, uh, the actual object. So then it's important to, uh, to mask to start masking the field already. So be aware of the contrast, be aware of the unique colors that, you, that is uh, surrounding your figure. Yeah. All right, so let's go to the next and the last feature that, that is entirely new, and that is uh, this one. No, not this one. Okay, the optimization is already there. So basically what you can do uh, is to well, enlarge the image in such a way that it doesn't uh, destruct too many pixels. Because the thing is, you know, whatever kind of uh, image enlarger you are using, I mean, that's always gonna be extrapolation, you know, interpolation. There's always gonna be uh, some pixels added, okay? So there's always gonna be some distortion. So it's, ne it's never gonna be completely perfect. That's something that you have to know. So we've made something based on uh, the Photoshop features that will uh, enlarge your image by two times, and we think that it's uh, doing that in a very subtle way that you don't see too many uh, diffraction or, or added uh, artifacts. Okay, it's, I think it's still very good. I, I use this to enlarge my photos if I want to print it large. And by the way, all my photos are always going to be printed. So I'm, uh, I'm editing my images not so much to put it on uh, on Instagram. Well, of course, I also put it on Instagram or Facebook, but that's not the important part. I also process my images to make sure that it looks great when I print it large, okay? Because then all those subtle details will matter a lot, okay? I always create all my images to, make, uh, to, to have it printed. There's not one image that I've created that uh, is not gonna be printed at some point in time. All my images are gonna be printed. Okay, so this deals with that. So it's not very uh, interesting. I want to go to the other one. A question? One. Yeah. Do you distinguish uh, processing differences between a photo that you're going to put on the web and a photo that you're going to print? Do you keep a separate uh, processing file for printing ones? Yeah, sometimes I would change the, 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 the final print file. So the, the problem is that not, uh, let's say if you are uh, using a print, well, let's say I would say, I would always send it off to a printing lab, okay? I don't have the expensive equipment and large printers myself. So I would always send it off to a printing lab, a good one, by the way. So the thing is, they cannot always print the darkest tones that you can't see on my screen. So what I would usually do is to make sure that it falls within the range of that specific printer. And there are always very specific specifications depending on the printer and the, uh, the DMAX value that you use for a specific, that you have for a specific kind of paper. So those things all matter. So depending on the feedback of the, the printing lab, 
I would change some values in my in my final uh, print image. Okay, but that has to do with the limitations of printing. Is that clear, Mike? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna show demonstrate the last uh, thing that is with the uh, with this one with the multi sound adjustments. So for that, I'm just gonna take an image that uh, this one. All right. So this is the finished version. So basically, you're the first one who get to see this. My uh, client, of course, already saw this. So basically, all my images are from Qatar are done this specific kind of style. Uh, there's specific, hopefully you can see that too, a specific tonal balance in what I'm doing. Also there's a big difference, but the, let's say the older architecture pictures that I've been shooting. So I'm not gonna explain that why this visual difference is here, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's a very specific visual style that I like for my Qatar images. And uh, there's a specific balance in darker tones versus lighter tones, but also there's an importance for the mid gray. That is something that's very important. And that's something I'm gonna be explaining in the second part of this session as we go. So multi sound adjustments. So usually when I'm almost done with my image, well, actually when, I'm, when I think that I'm 99% done with my image, then there's always something that I see in my image that I think, okay, you know, this needs to be a little bit lighter, but this needs to be a little bit darker. But if I, let's say, change this part here, it will have consequences for the contrast here, for the contrast there, for the contrast here. And if I change something here, it will have a consequence for the entire contrast here and here. So those subtle differences are so important. So what I've created now, is something called multi-zone adjustments. And what it will do is that uh, it will target three main areas. So what it does behind the scenes is to create wide range luminosity mass, covering uh, the shadows, covering the mid-tones and covering the lighter tones. Okay, so three zones. That's what those luminosity mass are covering in the background. So if I want something to be lighter, or just want the image to be uh, lighter in the lightest areas. I just click on lights and it will make sure that the rest will be adjusted uh, in the same kind of way, in a proportionate way. So I can set the intensity like this, but so like 100% and you see that it gets lighter, but the contrast will roughly remain the same. That's something that's very important to me that the contrast will not change. Well, of course, it will always change a little bit, but in such a subtle way that it doesn't take away from the first impression of the image, okay? So that's why what it does. So it not, it not only, uh, let's say, brightens up the, the lighter areas, it also takes into account how the shadows look like and how the mid-tones look like. And the same for this. If I just want the image to be dark in some of the darkest areas, I can click on this. And then it will adjust also the lighter tones in a proportionate way. So I can click on that. And the contrast will roughly remain the same. So that the first impression, for me, that is important. The first impression you get from an image is always uh, decided by the, the amount of darker tones and that should always be less than the lighter tones and the mid-gray tones and the contrast. Okay, that has to do with visual balance, okay? Something I'm not gonna explain here. But for me, that the visual balance, the visual perception, the instant visual perception that you get by looking at the image first, that is important to me. I wanted to keep that intact while I'm trying to lighten or darken some parts. So that's what this is doing. It's basically the, the, the last, phase in your post-processing to just a, just a little bit darker mid-tones or lighter tones. And can you show your, uh, I'm sorry, can you show your histogram? Oh yeah, sure. So this is uh, after, this is before. It's a, there are very subtle differences, you see that? 
Thank you. Yeah. But the main idea is not so much to, to let's say, to stretch out or to, uh, let's say, uh, make the histogram more compact. It's more to get the same kind of visual impression, you know, in terms of total contrast in the main areas of the image. Okay, that, that's the main goal. Because for me, again, that tonal balance, you know, the, the tonal contrast, that is the most important thing in my photo. Joel, what about the midtones? Yeah, you can do that too with this, with the, with the mids, you see that? But what about, what's the exact question about the midtones? What effect does it create when you hit the midtones? Okay, let me, let me show you that. Okay. It will make the midtones just a little bit different. I hope you see that the, the blacks and the whites aren't that, let's say, changed, right? You see a little bit more of the mid grays in there. I can so show you're you. expanding the contrast in the midtones. Yes. So, for example, this is before. I would always zoom out or squint your eyes to, to see it even better. Okay. So, this is before. I think you should be able to see that the impression of gray, mid gray is more there after, right? I hope you see that too. Yeah. Right? So it's, it is all very subtle. Again, you can, and the only way to see it very accurately is to either squint your eyes or better yet to zoom out like that, because then you see the, the specific areas that contain specific kind of tonal values. Okay, this is uh, something that I always do. Okay, more on that, on facial balance and how to create depth with the, with the new technique. And the second part, after the break, so for now, are there any questions about this, uh, about this part, about the new UXP version, the new features? So basically this is something that I didn't find that interesting, but I thought it was needed to explain that to, to everyone as well. So Joel, do you run all three of those or you just do one or the other? Usually I would just use one or the other and sometimes two, but you know, if, it, if I have to use two, then basically I've done something wrong in the, in the other post-processing part of my image. I mean, it's usually just a slight correction, something like either darks, a little bit of midtones or lights and usually set to, the slider set to something like 50% at, at most. It's always very subtle. Uh, changes. Joe, for this type of commissioned work, yeah. you are not allowed to remove signs or, or to alter the reality in any way, like those grids along the wall uh, that, that I, I assume that normally you would remove them no. because they can be a distraction. Normally, I wouldn't remove them. Basically, you know, I very rarely remove things out of my photos. It very rarely happens. The only thing that I remove are, let's say, uh, uh, sensor dust and other dust marks in my photo. But things like that, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer to keep what you shot uh, in your photo. Okay. And I know that there are people who are, let's say, who find this distracting. And actually, I find it to be adding to the, uh, to the content of my image, but that's something very personal. I never ever removed that. And talking about my client, by the way, he gave me complete artistic freedom. He said, Joel, do what you wanna do. We just wanna see your photos in your specific style. You do whatever you wanna do and you pay you handsomely and they did by the way. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, uh, they, they left me alone for three months. I could work on, this Im on my images uh, well, very easily, without any annoyance, without any disturbance, nothing at all. So I, I could have removed that, but I didn't. It, it is- or What about trying to minimize them, uh, maybe reduce the contrast around them or something? I could have done that, but the thing is, you know, I, I like that geometric shape over there. And it, for, for me, it, uh, for me, architecture is all about Geometry as well, you know, it's it's a very important aspect of uh, of architecture, and you know, I'm not bothered by it. 
and that's why I left it. And I, I think uh, I like the balance as it is in here. And, you know, I would feel like it would be cheated if I tried to remove it. And uh, I would very rarely do that. All right. But I, you, I, I can understand that you find it distracting. But the thing is, you know, it's something that is uh, put into the minds of people almost, right? I mean, you have to get rid of science, you have to get rid of this, you have to get rid of uh, cables or antennas, or whatever. The thing is, you know, that is something that has been almost, uh, uh, it's like people have been brainwashed to, to get rid of that. It's just like the rule of thirds. I mean, you know, I really don't care about the rule of thirds or the golden ratio. Architecture is about something completely different. Of course, at some point, I would take into account the rule of thirds, but it's not the, major, uh, the most important rule for me, you know? And, and, and I can go on and on like that, you know? But things like that, uh, you know, I try to look at it as if I've never seen an image before. And I like it like that, you know? And the thing is, you will most likely be disturbed by that part because you are almost trained to see like that. While no one ever gave me a, a solid explanation why that is wrong, why that is so distracting. Because for me, you know, as long as it's not as the highest contrast is not there, I don't find it distracting. The highest contrast is here. Here's where the eyes will go to, to the brightest light and the highest contrast. Not so much here. While you will see it, but it, you know, I don't feel like I'm being distracted by that. But that's a very personal opinion, by the way. Joe, I have a question. Um, is it possible to get bending? While uh, doing the adjustment on the multi-zone adjustment? Sorry, I didn't hear that question. I, I just heard parts of your question. Yeah, I was wondering if you're doing the adjustment on the multi-zone, uh, yeah. is there a possibility to get banding? Well, there's always a possibility to get banding, but that's not, let's say, uh, something that's been created by the panel, but that's something that you always need to be aware of, you know, uh, because banding has to do with, with, with well, uh, with something else. First of all, it has to do with, uh, with how Photoshop downscales your image to, to, to eight bits, if you are, even if you're working 16 bits. So there's a possibility that it is fake banding. So in that case, you just need to zoom in up to 100%, then it will upscale again to 16 bits. And if you don't see the banding anymore, then it's called fake banding. But sometimes the banding will still remain, and that's because you're pushing the contrast quite a bit in a specific area where the tonal values are, are, are not very uh, are not varying uh, enough, because then you get this kind of banding, and that is something that is uh, already baked in, in Photoshop, and that is actually something that they are dealing with for many years, uh, and they cannot uh, correct that for some reason, and I don't know why, but uh, yeah, you know, whenever you push the contrast too much it will result in some kind of banding, either fake banding or the real banding. Okay, but- Well, I have a question. Yeah. Thank you. It's regarding to tonality, there's a technique by a, uh, a Joel Grimes where mm -hmm. he does ISO HDR, and he's finding that he can push tones, he doesn't get banding, and he can get a lot more tonality throughout the images, especially grayscales, black and white. Okay, I don't know that technique. I've never seen it. Yeah, well, it's only a few people that do it, and and uh, it's not built into the camera. You have to almost use the only software I found that does it is uh, the, uh, the there's a program called Cast Cable, which they've created a special program so I can compute my Nikon camera, and it'll do uh, three 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 shots with ISO differences, and it creates perfect tonality. Okay, so so you should look into. So that's not done in Photoshop, or, or is it? It's uh, it's done in Photoshop, and you do it in their special section. You put it in Camera Raw. You have three photographs, and then you bring it in. You do uh, HDR Pro. Okay, so and it creates a thirty-two bit image in in the in the Adobe Camera Raw. Then you can do your tonality and bring it back into Photoshop as uh, sixteen bit. Okay. Okay. So well. I've heard about uh, some 32 bits processing, but uh, you know we've also considered doing that because then you have even uh, even less banding, but it doesn't work on all the features in this panel or in Photoshop. So that's why we didn't do it yet. But I think it has to do with the 32 bits uh, processing. That's what I think that. Because if the only way, I mean, it's almost impossible to avoid banding if you push the contrast really hard in a, in a 16 bits Photoshop, okay, 16 bits processing. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's do the break, uh, Mike, and then uh, reconvene after the break in 10 minutes. Is that okay with all of you?